Hello, and welcome to our preview on the muscular tissues lab. Now, the thing to keep in mind with muscular tissues is this is the third of the tissue types that we're going to be talking about. So we've talked about epithelial tissues, where the cells are in close proximity to one another, and connective tissues, where the cells are scattered away from one another, and the intervening space is filled with extracellular material. And so with epithelial tissues and connective tissues, we're looking at tissues that are essentially uh, grouped together uh, anatomically. Uh, so they're similar in uh, kind of organization. Uh, now we're going to look at uh, the muscular tissues as an example of a tissue that's kind of grouped together based on its functional specializations. And with the muscular tissues, we're going to be looking at cells that are structurally and functionally specialized for contraction. And so one of the overwhelming uh, characteristics associated with muscle cells is that they're going to have the presence of myofilaments within their cytoplasm. And so lots of cytoplasmic protein elements, which are going to give them kind of a pinkish staining appearance uh, throughout their cell body, uh, because we're going to be looking at both the thin filaments and the thick filaments, uh, the actin containing thin filaments, as well as the myosin containing thick filaments. Now, in general, it's going to be very difficult to see the individual cells uh, in a lot of detail. I'm, I'm not sorry, the individual proteins within the cells in a lot of detail, unless you're looking at an electron micrograph. Uh, but you can get uh, a good indication about what these proteins are doing uh, and how they're located when you take a look at a hematoxin and eosin stained uh, specimen. Now, the first example of um, muscle tissue that we're going to look at is going to be skeletal muscle. And with skeletal muscle, uh, again, taking a look at this kind of from that transition from the gross anatomy down to the microscopic level, uh, a single fiber, a single skeletal muscle fiber, is going to correspond to a single skeletal muscle cell. And so in mature skeletal muscle, what you're going to be looking at are going to be very elongated cells. So very, very thin cells, but very, very long cells. And so they're essentially going to form unbranched cylinders and incredibly long. They're going to run uh, kind of the length of the, the anatomical muscle. And so we're going to have the situation where they're going to be multinucleated. And so each nucleus is going to be responsible for a small segment of that skeletal muscle cell. And so they're going to be multi multinucleated. And so the nuclei, uh, many nuclei to the cell, these long cylindrical cells, nuclei are going to be located peripherally and they're in essence going to be flattened underneath the plasma membrane, underneath what's referred to as the sarcolemma, as the muscle cell uh, plasma membrane. So again, in this image we can see a, a longitudinal section of skeletal muscle up here at the top. You can see that cross striation pattern uh, indicating that the sarcomeres that are present. So we know that the the myofilaments, the thin, filling, uh, thin filaments and the thick filaments are going to be lined up, the actin and myosin is going to be lined up in a good repeating structure. And so we can see this as what's described as striated uh, muscle. And so we can see the, essentially the stripes in essence of the sarcomeres. Now it's, it's difficult to be able to look at that and see the different uh, kind of boundaries that we talked about in the lecture talking about a sarcomere. We really need a uh, an electron micrograph to be able to see that, but we can see this as an example of striated muscle. The nuclei are going to be peripherally no located, essentially sitting underneath uh, the sarcolemma. In a cross section of skeletal muscle down here with the hematoxin and eosin stained specimen, we can see an individual cell, kind of, kind of a circular area like that, kind of a circular area like that, uh, and the nuclei are going to be peripherally located, so flattened up underneath the sarcolemma. And the majority of the cell is just going to be coarse staining cytoplasm, which is going to represent the myofilaments. And so the thick filaments and the thin filaments giving it a coarse uh, pink staining. Again, the pink staining because we got a lot of protein within this area. Now, especially within skeletal muscle, we're going to have very distinct uh, connective tissue sheaths that are going to be present. And they're going to have names similar to what we saw with the nervous tissues uh, in the previous lab. And so this is a lower magnification view of a cross-section through muscle. And so you can see the, the different profiles of these skeletal muscle cells. They're going to be coming out of the screen towards you and running kind of in a long distance, kind of into the screen and, and back out towards you. So we're just seeing the cross-section. So we see the, the coarse staining appearance, the, uh, the uh, myofilaments, the thick filaments and the thin filaments, giving us the pink staining uh, to the inside. Now outside of these cells, 
what we're going to have is an endomesium. That endomesium is going to be a de delicate connective tissue sheath, which is going to be surrounding individual muscle fibers and helping to attach them to one another. Now, outside of these bundles, essentially we see a situation, we've got a whole bunch of these skeletal muscle cells organized into a bundle. We're going to be surrounding that with a paramecium. A paramecium is a dense connective tissue, which is going to be surrounding kind of a cluster of muscle fibers, which we refer to as a bundle or a fascicle of fibers. And so the paramecium then is going to group these different skeletal muscle fibers, uh, these bundles together. So we've got a bundle here, another bundle here, another bundle over here, another kind of smaller bundle kind of coming into the screen over here at this point. So we can see lots of bundles within this region. Now, outside of the entire kind of gross anatomical muscle, kind of around uh, different bundles of these muscle fascicles, we're going to have an epimesium. And the epimesium is going to look similar to what we've got here with the paramecium, uh, but it's going to be a little bit thicker, uh, a little bit more um, kind of organized, a little bit more dense uh, kind of collection of connective tissue, because that's going to be surrounding that gross anatomical muscle. Uh, the paramecium is going to be similar to it, and it essentially serves as like a wall or a septa uh, extension of the epimecium. The second type of muscle we're going to be taking a look at in lab is going to be the cardiac muscle. And again, it's going to be an example of a striated muscle. And so if you take a look at it, you can see uh, in a good image that kind of that cross striation pattern uh, present from uh, the sarcomeres, uh, that kind of organized, uh, repeated structure uh, of the sarcomeres. If we take a look at this, kind of, again, from the gross anatomical perspective, we're going to see that the muscle, if we were to try to dissect it out, is going to be this interwoven bundle of muscle fibers. And so, again, that's going to be important because kind of interwoven so that when the cardiac muscle, the heart muscle, contracts, it's going to be condensing down the lumen, the space, the ventricles uh, within the heart as much as possible. And so we want to really wrap around the heart so when it contracts, we're able to squeeze out as much as possible within that contraction. So we got an example of a strided muscle with cardiac muscle. We're going to have this interwoven network of muscle fibers, but in contrast to the skeletal muscle, the skeletal muscle, we have these long fibers formed by these cells that essentially fuse together, forming a single very, very long cell. In cardiac muscle and heart muscle, these muscle fibers are going to be composed of individual little car, car, cardiac myoblasts, you know, these cardiac muscle cells that connect up with one another, but they don't fuse together. And so they're going to be individual cells, sometimes branching cells, but the cells are going to be connected. So you can have many cells within a single muscle fiber. Uh, and again, because of the branching network of these cells and branching network of these fibers, it's going to wrap around uh, the myocardium is going to wrap around the heart and allow for very forceful contraction to empty uh, the ventricles, the spaces within the heart. We take a look at these cells. They're still going to be long, but it's essentially much shorter than what we'd see uh, within skeletal muscle. They may be branched. Uh, if we take a look at the nuclei, skeletal muscle, we had many nuclei, the nuclei peripherally located, flattened. In cardiac muscle and heart muscle, we're going to have one or possibly two kind of ovoid central nuclei. So the nucleus is going to be towards the center. And then surrounding that, we're going to have mitochondria and lots and lots of these myofilaments, lots of the actin and the myosin containing uh, sarcomeres. So if we take a look at this in cross section, you can see, again, that cross striation pattern indicating the sarcomeres that are present. Centrally placed nuclei, you can see an intercalated disc here uh, between this cell and the next cell, another intercalated disc in this point. We get another intercalated disc down here. Uh, nuclei centrally located. Um, so again, a good example of uh, longitudinal appearance of cardiac muscle. In cross-section, again, we take a look at a cell uh, at this point here. Lots of that coarse pink staining, because we got lots of protein present here, in the uh, actin and the myosin and the associated protein. A centrally placed nucleus, uh, kind of round or ovoid, looking at it in cross-section through this, uh, located relatively central to the cell, as opposed to peripherally, which we saw in the skeletal muscle. Now, one of the unique features of cardiac muscle is the presence of the intercalated disc. So again, keep in mind that a cardiac, a heart muscle fiber, is composed of lots of these individual cells coming together and essentially connecting up with one another. And you want them to have a very, very strong connection. And so when the heart muscle contracts, you don't want them to pull apart from one another. And so these intercalated discs are going to be these transverse lines 
that are going to be present. They're going to serve as the boundary between neighboring cells. Now within the intercalated disc, we're going to have fascia adherents, which are going to be similar to our zonulate adherents. Uh, they're going to be anchoring sites for those terminal sarcomeres. So we're going to be connecting up with uh, the adjacent cells. Um, and in this case, it's going to be along these intercalated discs as opposed to wrapping around the cells. We're also going to have macula adherence, and so a little uh, kind of spot connections, uh, which are going to keep the cells together, again, to strengthen it. Keep in mind that the fascia adherence are going to be connected to uh, the sarcomeres connected to the myofilaments. The macula adherence are going to be connected to uh, other cytoskeletal elements. So they distribute the stress across the entire cell. So when the cell is contracting, it's not just pulling on the cell membrane. It's going to be pulling through that cell membrane onto the cytoskeletal and the myofilament elements in that next cell. Also within the intercalated discs are going to be gap junctions. And again, gap junctions similar to what we talked about in the epithelial cells uh, lecture. Uh, gap junctions are going to be small ion channels between adjacent cells that are allowing for electrical coupling uh, for these muscle cells. So ions are able to flow very rapidly from the cytoplasm of one cardiac muscle cell to the next, allowing for uh, the stimulus uh, signal, essentially allow for synchronous contraction to occur. Now, you're going to be able to see the transverse lines in a good example of uh, cardiac muscle in a longitudinal section, but you're not going to be able to identify the fascia adherence, immaculate adherence, or gap junctions without an uh, electron micrograph. And then the final uh, type of muscle cells are going to be the smooth muscles. And the smooth muscle cells uh, are smooth because they still have the myofilaments, but they're not organized in that nice cross-righted pattern, not organized in the repeated sarcomere structure uh, that we saw in skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. So it has a smooth appearance because the myofilaments are going to be organized uh, very differently within smooth muscle. The smooth muscle cells are going to be a lot smaller. They're not going to have the elaborate uh, contraction mechanism, stimulus contraction mechanism we saw uh, in cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle because they're going to be slower contracting uh, than what we see uh, in both cardiac and skeletal muscle. So we take a look at smooth muscle cells. They're going to be kind of spindle shaped uh, and they're going to have a single central ovoid nucleus. And so what we can see is in this image we've got two slides uh, with both longitudinally oriented smooth muscle cell along the bottom, longitudinally uh, oriented smooth muscle cells here, as well as cross sections. So in this case, the smooth muscle cells are running kind of along this orientation or in this orientation. In this point over here and this point over here on the upper slide, what we're looking at is essentially circular profiles. So we're looking at a cross section or a slice through a portion of the cell. So again, in the longitudinal section, you can see kind of a staggered appearance of the nuclei. You can see these kind of spindle-shaped cells kind of getting narrower uh, as kind of the next cell kind of gets widened uh, at the next point. Uh, in cross-section, we're going to have some relatively large circular profiles and then smaller circular profiles. And this is especially prevalent down here on this bottom slide. Not all of which have nuclei because these are long spindle-shaped cells. When we cut through it, sometimes we're going to be cutting through the, the kind of end of the spindle. Other times we're going to be cutting through it uh, where the nucleus is going to be located. So lots of circular profiles, not all of which have a nucleus present because of the plane of section we're looking at. Uh, so that's a good characteristic associated with uh, smooth muscles. That finishes up our pre-lab for muscle. Uh, hopefully this will allow you then to look at the images associated with uh, the slides uh, and the different activities and be able to uh, identify the structures we're talking about. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thank you.